Welcome to our Making Sense of Game Simulation walkthrough. In this video, we'll show you something that's never been done before. Also, the complete assessment covering ecosystem creation, Red Rock study, and plant defense games that our Prep Matter team has created. I highly encourage you to solve the game along with me so you can experience the game firsthand. Also, make sure to visit our website, Prep Matter, to get access to this interactive simulation. This will be your best resource for scoring well in this assessment and it is almost half the price of our only competitor offering a comparable interactive game. I should mention that we've created many different scenarios and possible answers for each of those three games. So you can play our simulation game after watching this video as well. While this video is solely about the complete game walkthrough, if you're interested in learning in detail about the features of each game, as well as our tips and tricks to assess this assessment, watch our other video too. Let's begin. Before we start, if it's your first time hearing about us, PrepMatter provides end-to-end -end support to secure your consulting into you and get the offer. You can check our website if you'd like to access to more content for building your resume, acing online assessments, as well as case and fit interviews. We also provide one-on-one -on -one coaching to elevate your performance. Also, feel free to add me on LinkedIn. I'm always eager to connect with aspiring consultants and will be very happy to answer your questions. In this video, I'll cover the ecosystem creation game first, followed by the Red Rock study. This will be the best representation of making this soul game. Towards the end, we'll also go over plant defense. Even though this game was recently replaced by Red Rock study, let's play it safe in case making it decides to reintroduce this game. All right, let's begin prep matter simulation. I'll choose ecosystem core reef in task one. As we start the game, we first have the introduction. Let's read it. As the island steward, overseeing numerous species across diverse ecosystems, you're now in charge of expanding a sustainable habitat in the coral reef. Your goal is to establish a new habitat within the existing region of the island, fostering eight species that can thrive and form a balanced food web. Rely on the guidebook and monitors to select species that contribute to a stable ecosystem. With time pause, let's get familiar with the instructions. Our objectives are to select eight species that will survive as an ecosystem. Choose the location of the ecosystem and submit it. On the right, we have our monitor indicators. And at the bottom, we have the guidebook, species, and location selection. Let's review the task rules and available species in the guidebook. On the left, I can see the species and their requirements. You can click Add to add them to our species selection list and we can see the eating rules on the right. It's a bit complicated, so let's read them to make sure that we are clear. The species with the highest calories provided eats first. It consumes its food source with the highest calories provided. In case of a tie, it eats equally from both species. When a food source is eaten, its calories provided decrease permanently by an amount equal to the eating species' calories needed. If the eating species needs more calories, it eats another food source based on current calories provided. Then the species with the next highest current calories provided eats species that end with their calories needed fully met and more than zero calories provided survive. I know it's a bit complicated, but as we start solving it, it will make a lot of sense. All right, everything is clear to me, let's begin. I'd like to pick the location first. To do this, we should first identify which four monitors are relevant. For that, let's refer to the species card. I see depth range, temperature range, water current range, and salt content range. Now I'll hover around and pick a point. You can always change it if needed. In ecosystem creation games, all producers and animals typically inhabit three different depth ranges. Since I chose a value about 100 meters, I should be already eliminating two-thirds of the entire producers and animals. Let's start with the producers. I'll take the ones who can live in the death range of 100 and above. These species are red moss, sea fan, and sea lettuce. Now let's move to the animals. To make my life easier, I'll open the cards of each animal one by one and leave the ones open who can survive in my chosen death range.
For the sake of this video though, I'll keep the section brief and only mention the species that can survive in our chosen death range. Alright, blue jellyfish can survive in our death range, let's keep this open. Glass squid works, great. Great white shark can. Green sea turtle can survive as well. Lanternfish and loggerhead sea turtle can inhibit our death range. Sea urchin, shrimp, and spade fish can inhibit our death range. Let's keep the cards open. And lastly, swordfish can survive in our chosen death range. Let me count. All right. So we are left with 10 animals that can live in the death range. There are three other requirements too. Temperature, water current, and salt content ranges. I'll check at the end if all species requirements are fully met as well. Now we need to pick five animals out of those 10. Let me write down the producers on my paper first. I'll put my legend on the top right, writing the species name. And in brackets, calories provided and then calories needed. Red moss provides 3000 calories and requires none. Sea fan offers 3500 calories and also requiring none. And sea lettuce, much like red moss, provides 3000 calories and requires none. Great, I have it all written. Now we must select an animal that consumes these producers. Let's review the list. Blue jellyfish consume both red moss and sea lettuce, while green sea turtles feed on one producer, but also prey on other animals. Similarly, loggerhead sea turtles feed on one producer and other animals as well. Sea urchins consume two producers. Shrimp also feed on two producers. Spade fish eat sea fan alone. And swordfish, they don't feed on any of our producers. I'll note down only those that feed on one or two producers exclusively to keep complexity to a minimum. Starting with the blue jellyfish, they provide 4,500 calories and need 3,000. They'll feed on red moss and sea lettuce. Now let's illustrate it with arrows. Next, we consider sea urchin. 2,100 calories provided with a need of 3,000. Feasting on sea fan and sea lettuce. So sea fan and sea lettuce. Then comes shrimp, offering 2,750 calories and they need 1,450. Feeding on sea lettuce. And lastly, let's look at spade fish. Spade fish provide 2,100 calories and they need 2,400 and they only consume sea fan. Okay. Before introducing another animal, we should ensure our ecosystem is balanced. The blue jellyfish with the highest calorie provision will consume red moss and sea lettuce equally leaving each with 1,500 calories. Next, the shrimp will also feed on red moss and sea lettuce equally, taking 725 from each, which leaves both with 775 calories. However, since sea urchin and spade fish both offer the same calories, they'll split their food source. 
given C fans higher calorie provision, they'll consume it equally. Unfortunately, this exhausts C fan entirely, which is not sustainable. So we may have to remove spade fish from our ecosystem. This leaves sea urchin consuming 3000 calories from sea fan, leaving sea fan with the remaining 500 calories, a sustainable scenario. We now have three producers and three animals, necessitating the addition of two more animals to our ecosystem. Let's consider our existing animals and determine which predators feed on them, continuing to build our food pyramid. Blue jellyfish, let's look into that. Blue jellyfish are preyed upon one animal. Let's go to shrimp. They serve as food for three animals. Let's look at sea urchins. They are consumed by two. To simplify, we'll choose an animal that preys on blue jellyfish. And that is the loggerhead sea turtle. Let's write it down. Loggerhead sea turtle, they provide 4,400 calories and they need 4,350. They have multiple potential food sources, but they'll target blue jellyfish first because of the higher calorie count. The jellyfish's 4,500 calories fully satisfy the sea turtle's needs, leaving a surplus of 150 calories. Excellent. We now need one final animal. Let's see who feeds on loggerhead sea turtle. It's the great white shark. We'll add this to our documentation. Let's write it down. Great white shark has a calorie provision of 6,000. And they need 4,250 calories, feeding on the loggerhead sea turtle, which offers more calories than the shark needs. It's great. This confirms our food web is sustainable. All right, now that we've selected our species, as I promised, I need to just quickly make sure that all the species we've selected can survive in this particular location. We are sure about the death range. I'm just going to quickly check if they can also survive within the temperature, water current, and salt content ranges. So let's just do a quick run. Let's start with the temperature first. Let's go through all the species that we've selected and compare it with the location that we've selected as well. Okay. All right, there doesn't seem to be any huge problem. They can all live within this temperature range. Uh, let's just do quickly with the water current as well. Now I'm just gonna quickly go through our species that we've selected, making sure that they're also within that water current. I'm pretty sure they are. Okay. Fine, there's no problem with it too, great. Lastly, salt content. I also don't think there's gonna be any problem, but it's always good to be safe. Fantastic, yeah. I don't see any problem here. I think we're pretty much done. Let's finalize our assessment by clicking complete task. Let's check our results. All right. All our species can survive, fantastic, great job. Let's switch gears to the Red Rock study. In this segment, I'll tackle one of the many scenarios available on our interactive course. We'll start by walking through the introduction together. Welcome to Red Rock Island. As a new research assistant, your responsibility will be to utilize data gathered in the field to contribute to various studies and cases here at Red Rock Labs. Our approach to studies is structured in a three-stage system, investigation, analysis and report. During the investigation phase, we'll swift through collected observations and pinpoint the most pertinent data points. Moving on to the analysis stage, we will scrutinize the data and execute calculations based on the study's questions. We can drag any movable data point into the research journal for later use. The research journal is our tool to review reorder, highlight, and label collected data points. Let's hit continue. In the report stage, we'll craft and submit written and visual reports grounded in our analysis. Remember, we can navigate back to the information from the investigation stage if you're in the analysis stage. After tackling the study, we will encounter cases. These are concise questions exploring various research topics. 
information from cases is distinct from the studies and other cases. All right, with that framework in mind, let's dive in. The study investigates the ecosystem in Nolotils, which is one of the largest mountain ranges in the Alps. As we covered before, we need to drag some information to the research journal that we think we need to use later in the case. Okay. The objective is to analyze the changes in the different ecosystems variables, such as snowfall, glacier area, and the number of species in Nolotils. Let's track this already and read the study information. Nolotils is a mountain range based in northern Italy. They have a high series of mountains ranging from an altitude of 2,000 meters to 4,200 meters. In this area, there are plenty of lakes. Though Nolotils hosts the highest number of lakes in the Alps, the number of lakes it has has decreased significantly over the past years. It has 19 lakes, down from 23, 10 years ago, and from 25, 20 years ago. On top of the Great Lakes, the area has one of the largest glaciers in the world. The glaciers cover an area of 150 square kilometers. This figure is also down from 170 square kilometers 10 years ago. Wildlife in Nolotils is also quite diverse compared to the neighboring areas. There are 283 species including 97 animals and 186 plants. These numbers are also down from the previous decades as wildlife remains in danger with the increasing impact of climate change. In addition to these natural characteristics, the facilities in the Nolotils area have grown with a tremendous pace in the past decades. Currently, the region hosts 47 hotels, 16 climbing camps, and three tea houses on the mountains. All right, it was a long written context. Let's examine the exhibits. The first exhibit presents average snowfall statistics by month, with orange bars indicating average snowfall in inches, and a blue line representing the number of snowfall days per month. Both metrics hit their peak in January and February as expected. The second exhibit illustrates average snow death by month, where the orange area indicates the average base depth, and the combined orange and green areas reflect the average summit depth in inches, peaking around March. Interesting. Before we progress to the analysis phase, it's crucial we transfer the necessary information to the research journal. While it is possible to revisit the investigation phase during analysis, it could result in penalties. Given our goal to analyze snowfall, glacier area, and species number, I'll play it safe and drag over any data point related to these aspects. We'll skip the altitude data as it seems unrelated. Now. Regarding the number of lakes and their trends, it seems wise to drag all five data points. 19 lakes, 23 lakes, 10 years, 25 lakes, and 20 years. Following this, we have data on glaciers. Let's secure all of it. 150 and 170 square kilometers plus the 10-year marker. Next up, we encounter species data, which could be useful. Let's select 283 species, 97 animals, and 186 plants. The final paragraph's details on infrastructure don't pertain to snowfall, glacier areas, or species, so we'll omit these data points. In terms of the exhibits, I suggest we drag pretty much all the data points to be thorough. To keep things organized, let's first move the average snowfall data points. It's gonna take me some time to drag it, so let's do that now. But in the meantime, I must say that, unfortunately, you have to do these kind of things because you can go back earlier, but then once you're in the report phase, you really cannot, so it's better to be safe. All right, I'm pretty much done with dragging all data points. All right. Although there are numerous data points on the right, each comes with a title, and we can always click on the data point to get more information. It's relatively straightforward. I won't rename any data points or mark them as important for now, but if you feel the need, you can always to do so for clarity. Now, let's advance to the analysis stage. Here we'll respond to questions using the information from the investigation section. 
The calculator will be a handy tool for some of these calculations. Here's the first question. What is the difference in the number of snowfall days between the month receiving the highest average snowfall and the lowest average snowfall between November and May? We need to first find the number of snowfall days in the month receiving the highest average snowfall. Let's refer to our research journal. I remember we dragged some data points from the exhibits earlier. Let's find which month has the highest average snowfall. It is February with 11 days of snowfall. Now let's determine the month with the lowest number of snowfall days again. All right, it appears to be May with no snowfall days recorded. Therefore, the difference is 11 days. We'll document this in the research journal for future reference. Let's move to the second question. How much higher in percentages is the difference between the highest and the lowest average snow death values for the summit compared to that of the base between December and April? First, we need to calculate the difference in snow death at the summit. Let's consult our research journal to identify the month with the deepest snow at the summit. All right, I'm still looking. Great. March is the peak with 47 inches. Considering our time frame from December to April, let's take a look. December has the shallowest snow with 10 inches, resulting in a 37 inch difference. Now let's examine the base snow death values. We'll find the highest first. All right. April has the highest base depth at 35 inches. And for the lowest, let's take a look at it again. It's December again with eight inches, making a 27 inch difference. Since we need to calculate how much higher the summit difference is compared to the base, we'll subtract 27 from 37 inches and divide the results by 27 inches to get the percentage. So let's use the calculator. It comes out to 37%. Our third question is, what are the percentage reductions in the number of lakes and glacier coverage areas in the Nolotils region over the past 10 years. I understand we have two sub-questions to address. Let's begin with the first one. The percentage decrease in the number of lakes over the past 10 years. We'll refer back to our research journal where we previously noted relevant data points. All right, there were 23 lakes a decade ago. Let's look at the current one. Now there are only 19. To calculate the percentage change, we'll take 23 minus 19 and divide by 23. Let's use a calculator. That gives us a decrease of 17%. Excellent. Now for the second sub question, the percentage decrease in the glacier coverage. Consulting the research journal once more, we see that the glacier area was 170 square kilometers 10 years ago, but it is now reduced to 150. To find a percentage difference, we subtract 150 from 170 and divide by 170. That comes out to about 12%. Now, I'm prepared for the next question. What is the month with the highest percentage difference between the average summit depth and the average base depth? And how much is the percentage difference in that month? Great. I've got the necessary data points previously moved to my research journal. Let's see what we've got. If needed, we can always review the exhibit, worst case. All right. 
Now I'll work out the percentage difference between the average summit depth and the average base depth for each month. Although the calculator shows the answers, I'll jot them down too on my paper to ensure accuracy. For December, the summit depth is 10 inches. And the base depth is 8 inches. So the difference is 25%. 10 divided by 8 minus 1. Moving to January, we need to divide 23 by 14 and subtract 1. Let's use the calculator. We get 64%. For February, we need to divide Let's see, that's 31 by 19 minus 1. So let's use a calculator again. It will be 63%. Let's move to the next month, March. We need to divide 47 by, let's check the figure, 33 minus 1. It will be 42%, okay? Finally, we have April. We need to divide, let's check the value, 42 by 35 and let's minus 1 20% looking over my notes January has the highest difference at 64% perfect we reached the report stage of the study this part is not my favorite since we cannot revisit previous sections if we needed to that's why I moved as much information as possible into the research journal earlier I see 10 answer fields that we need to complete. We'll start by identifying the month with the highest average snowfall, marked by 11 snowfall days. This was part of the first question we answered, but we didn't specify the month then. Let's refer to our investigation journal to pinpoint the correct month. All right, this might take some time. All right. The answer is February, with an average of 31 inches of snowfall. The next answer field concerns the month with the least average snowfall, excluding May. I recall identifying two months with zero snowfall days. Let's review our research journal once more. Indeed, it's November that recorded the least snowfall. As noted before, this month had no snowfall days. All right, let's move on. Between December and April, the difference in snow depth at the summit was measured at what inches? I remember this was one of the questions we answered earlier. Let's look at our journal. All right, I think I'm getting there. Yeah, here we go. Correct, the difference at the summit is 37 inches. We just calculated it. Now let's determine the difference at the base. All right, it stands at 27 inches. For the percentage change, we can look back at the journal or recalculate it. I'll use a calculator for accuracy. Subtracting 27 from 37 yields 10. Dividing 10 by 27 gives us approximately 37%. Yes, this matches what we found earlier. Next, we need to decide if the number of lakes and glacier coverage in the Nolotils region has increased or decreased in the past 10 years. I remember it was decreasing. 
Let's select that. We now need to quantify the percentage decrease in the number of lakes. Let's look at the research journal. The change is 17%. Okay. I also need to find the same for the glacier coverage as well. Let's take a look. All right, the change is 12%. Lastly, we need to input how many species the region hosts. I remember dragging this data point earlier. Let's go over the journal. Great, it's 283. With that, I've completed the written report. And now it is time to select the appropriate graph. We need to choose a chart that effectively illustrates the maximum and minimum snowfall amounts and the number of snowfall days in winter, which are December, January, and February. We have three chart options, a bar graph, a line graph, or a pie chart. The bar graph seems most fitting since we have two distinct categories, snowfall and snowfall days. And we're comparing the extremes. I'll enter the values into the table methodically. For the winter months, we need the minimum and maximum snowfall days. Back to the research journal, let's take a look at it. It appears December has the fewest snowfall days at 8, while both January and February have the most at 11 days each. Let's note these figures. Now, for the snowfall amounts, revisiting the journal, December also had the least snowfall at 19 inches, and February had the most at 31 inches. We'll record these as well. All right, now our chart is in shape. It makes a lot of sense, but to be safe, I'll quickly click on the other two chart types making sure that they are not suitable for this data set. Looking at the line chart first, it just looks odd to me. Lines don't have any purpose to them since we are not showing tens of different time periods. Let's look at the pie graph. Again, it doesn't make sense to me. We usually use pie graphs to show the share of one unit in your total portfolio. So let's go back and choose the bar chart as our answer. All right, we finally finished my least favorite part of the game. Now we're at the cases section. We no longer need to use the research journal, so hopefully it will speed things up. Let's read the prompt of the first case. Nolotils is a mountain range in the Greater Alps region that hosts one of the highest number of species. These species are categorized under two buckets, animals and plants, while the breakdown within each category can be seen in the table below. All right, let's now read the question. If the number of flowers were as many as the number of trees in nolotils, how much would the number of total species increase in percentages? To determine the current total, we add all the numbers in the table. Using the calculator, we sum up 11, 21, 39, 26, 56, 126, and 101. The totals, 380. Now to figure out the increase, we see there are 126 trees and 56 flowers. If the flowers match the number of trees, we would have an additional 126 minus 56, which is 70 more. Adding 70 to our current total of 380, let's see that, it gives us 450. Let's enter this. Next, we calculate the percentage increase. We divide 450 by 380 and subtract 1. This gives us an increase of about 18%. We'll input this percentage into the answer field. Let's read the second case. Climate experts foresee that the meltdown in glaciers will accelerate over the next decades. While the current glaciers cover an area of 150 square kilometers, it used to cover 170 a decade ago. The proportion of glaciers that melt will be 8 percentage points higher over the next 10 years compared to that in the past decade. And the question is, what is the expected glacier coverage level 10 years from now? 
First, we need to calculate the percentage of glacier loss over the past decade. We take the current coverage of 150 square kilometers and divide it by the previous 170 square kilometers. And subtracting 1, we have a loss of around 12%. Now with the expected increase in melts of 8 percentage points, we add this to our current loss, reaching an estimated 20% loss. This means that the glaciers are predicted to decrease by an additional 20% in the next decade. Multiplying 80%, which is the remaining glacier proportion, by the current coverage of 150, gives us 120 square kilometers. We'll choose this option and proceed to the next case. The Ministry of Environment made a new plan to protect the wildlife in Nolatils. The plan is composed of three steps. Banning human activity that would risk wildlife, planting additional species to foster diversity in the area, capturing animals that deteriorate the wildlife. The chart below shows the expected impact of all three steps in the realistic and conservative scenarios. The impact is measured by the number of animal species prevented from extinction. The chance of realization by each scenario is also detailed in the chart below. All right, we have three charts showing exactly that. The question is, approximately how many animal species would be saved if the realistic scenario is realized for all three activities? This is quite straightforward. We'll multiply the anticipated number of species saved, indicated by orange bars, by the probability of each measure success and add the totals. By limiting human activities, we can potentially save eight species at a 60% success rate. Let's put this in the calculator. That is 4.8 species. Through additional planting, we can save five species with a 75% chance. And that equals 3.75 species. Finally, by capturing detrimental animals, we can save four species with an 80% likelihood, resulting in 3.2 species saved. Adding these figures all together, we approximate a total of 12 species saved. Let's select this as our answer. All right, we're now addressing the fourth case. This case focuses on benchmarking best practices for species preservation, against other mountain ranges worldwide, including Andes, Fuji, Himalayas, and Nolotils. An index ranging from 20 to 70 represents the success score of these efforts. Let's read the question. Before the loss of species, there used to be 106 animal species in the highest scoring region and 74 animal species in the lowest scoring region. What is the approximate percentage point difference between the proportions of total animal species that were lost in the two regions. First, we need to identify the region with the lowest score. The exhibit indicates it's the Himalayas, Nepal. To find a proportion lost, we divide the number of species lost by the initial count. The Himalayas lost 17 species out of an initial 74. Let's do the math. This gives us about 23%. We'll keep this figure in mind. Next, we calculate for the highest scoring region. Let's look at the exhibit. It is Fuji, Japan. Following a similar approach, we divide the number of species lost by the original count. In Fuji, 11 out of 106 species were lost. Calculating this, we get approximately 10%. The difference between these two proportions is 13%. Let's move on. This case examines the effect of climate change on the snowfall and snow thickness in the Nolotils region. The experts foresee that as a result of alarming speed of climate change, the snowfall will decrease as the snowfall distribution across different months will be disrupted over the next decades. That means the proportion of total snowfall received each month would change. These changes would significantly affect the wildlife and the landscape at the Nolotils. Recent studies show that the drop in the total snowfall can be as high as 12%, while this magnitude can be as high as 18% in months that are affected the most. On the other hand, 
Results indicate that snowfall will occur later than usual in the next decades. Let's look at the exhibit. We're seeing the expected snowfall and the snow death in 20 years. And the question is the following. Each 4 inch increase in snowfall causes a 3 inch increase in summit death and a 2 inch increase in the base death the following month. How much would the expected summit death and base death values in May if the snowfall in April increased by 25%? All right, that's a bit complicated. Let's try and solve it. In April, the snowfall is 16 inches. If it increases by 25%, the increase in the snowfall level in May will be 25% of 16, so 4 inches. We know that 4 inch increase in snowfall causes a 3 inch increase in summit depth. Hence, at the summit, the expected level will be 5 plus 3, let's do it over the calculator, 8 inches. At the base, we know that 4 inch increase causes a 2 inch increase in base depth. Hence, the new level at the base will be 2 plus 2, 4 inches. After all, we didn't use the long written information at the start of the case. Let's move to the final case. The three largest lakes in the Nolotils are Lago Nuevo, Lago de Mozza, and Lago Lungo. These lakes are hosting the most diverse ecosystems in the entire Alps region. While these lakes are the largest lakes in the region, they have shrunk significantly over the past years. The shrinkage has affected the diversity and the number of species in the lakes as well. The change has been observed across two areas. Decrease in the number of species. Some of the species have become extinct and some others have been moved to another area by government agencies to be protected from extinction. Decrease in the number of animals by species. The number of animals also decreased significantly across all kinds of species. There is also a table showing the change in four lakes over the past decade. Let's read the question. The table below shows the expected change in the ecosystem within the next 10 years. Which chart below visualizes best the information in the table below? We need to choose a waterfall, scatter plot, or a very wide graph. We're now looking at a table with three to four segments representing different ecosystems and three indicators for each. This setup calls for a clear visual representation. In this scenario, a scatter plot seems to be the best choice. Let's input the values and see how the table shapes up. All right. Here we go. This table is quite comprehensible, effectively showing the three indicators across all four ecosystems. Let's compare this with the waterfall chart. Once I look at it, it doesn't seem to provide a clear breakdown of the three indicators. Let's move to the very wide chart. It also falls short in clearly displaying all the necessary information. So the scatter plot is going to be our best bet. With that, we wrapped up the Red Rock game. At the end of prep matter simulation, you get a summary of your performance. Let's see how I did. The analysis for part one looks good. The report for part one is also solid and all the questions in part two are correct. There's an option to review submitted answers to go through the entire assessments and pinpoint any mistakes if you'd like. You can also download the answer sheet for a detailed explanation of each question. Now, let's delve into one of the plan defense scenarios. This will give you a grasp of the key game dynamics and some tips to excel. It's important to note that at present, plant defense has been replaced by the Red Rock study. So I'll only demonstrate one of the three plant defense games. Once you access Prep Meta Soul Simulation, you can practice all three games. And since our software generates each game randomly, you'll always encounter different maps and variable sets, allowing for extensive practice. I personally had a lot of fun playing plant defense games. All right, let's begin. Similar to the other games, we see a set of instructions at the start. Our goal is to keep the invaders away from the native plant as long as possible. The objective is displayed on the top right and the guidebook on the bottom left. We can use different actions like terrain transformation and defenders as defense mechanisms. Once our plan is complete, we need to click run plan and start implementing. We can easily track our plan actions and we can edit our actions that haven't been implemented yet as well. All clear. Invaders appear regularly. 
The number associated with an invader indicates its population size. And we can see the plant we are protecting in the middle of the grid. Let's begin the test. Let's first understand our invader. It's a fox with a population of 135. It is slowed by rocket terrain. I want to understand the specifics of our defense mechanisms. We have rocky, forest, cliff, rock python, and coyote. Since rocket terrain slows the fox down, let's start with that. I'll pick a spot that's closer to the native plant. I'll build another one. Now we should pick an animal to reduce the population of the fox. Let me pick rock python, as its damage is quite significant. I'll place it on both rocky terrains. Let's check how much hit points we would have. In each turn, we can hit 50. Since the fox will be slowed down due to the rocky terrain, we can reduce 200 of the fox population, which is more than enough. To diversify, let's put a forest next to the native plant. Interesting. Now a new invader appeared. Let's see if we need to revise our plan. I'll stick with my plan, because the forest can slow down groundhogs as well. All right. I need to decide on my action plan for the next five turns now. Let's put a forest to slow them down. I need to put some animals now to inflict damage on the groundhogs. I'll pick rock python as their damage is 50 and place them in both forests. Let's diversify resources. I'll pick coyote. But we can't put it anywhere we like. Let me place it somewhere closer. Let's place another one and run the plan. Great, the fox is depleted. The groundhog's population reduced a lot already. But now we have another set of groundhogs at the bottom of the map. Let's edit the plan. Just checking the potential hit points. It's not enough. We need to do something about it. Let's place rock python in the forest. Since groundhogs will slow down, we can double the hit points. Okay, now we can hit 80 times 2, 160 just in the forest grid alone. It should work out. Let's continue. Now we have our final five actions to plan. Since we can easily kill the groundhogs with our current setup, I'm not worried about putting more measures to slow them down. So let's try to build some defense around some empty areas of the grid closer to the native plant. I'll put a forest in two grids and place some coyote to create significant damage. All right, I feel confident about the setup. Let's see if it's sustainable. Perfect. We survived 24 turns, which is greater than the initial objective of 15. This concludes the video. If you'd like to experience the game yourself and maximize your chances to pass the assessment, check out Prep Matters Making the Solve Simulation. Best of luck with your assessment.